Today's class asks the, the question, are your ancestors hiding in an archive? Our presenter is James Tanner, and we welcome him as well and uh, are uh, happy to uh, have his assistance in these webinars. He's got an extensive background in family history and in genealogical research, and we appreciate his willingness to volunteer his time to share his knowledge and insights uh, to make us uh, better uh, apt to uh, be successful in our ventures. We'll now turn the time over to James. I'd like to welcome everybody here. We're going to be talking today about Are Your Ancestors Hiding in an Archive? And it's just kind of a catchy title, but the, the idea is probably uh, valid because they could be. <laughs> they could be a lot of information about your ancestors in archives and, and special collections libraries and libraries and museums and societies and all sorts of different places that uh, genealogists have uh, the time to look. And important thing to understand about both of these archives and special collections, they're really like black holes. They just sort of suck in everything, information you can think of. They have a tendency to compartmentalize everything that they receive. So basically what, what happens is you you need to examine exactly what kinds of things they're interested in, but if they're interested in things that pertain to your family or you're looking to research, you'll find that uh, they are the, the things they have are, are really surprising and usually a lot more detailed than you can possibly imagine. And we'll talk a bit about some of the collections as everything else as that go along here. First, some definitions. First of all, we need to know an archive is a collection of historical documents or records providing information about a place, an institution, or group of people. So there are lots of archives, as we'll find out, and in some of them are public, some of them are private, and some of them cost money to enter, some of them don't. It just depends. And learning about all of that is part of this process. The, the second uh, definition here is in library science, a special collections, or these are some abbreviations, are libraries or library units that house materials requiring specialized security and user services. Okay, so there, what's the difference between the two? Well. The only difference, real, only real difference is that a special collections library is just like an archive. And some of them have uh, archive-like buildings that where they house things, where temperature controlled, humidity controlled, everything. So just like an archive, except they're associated with a university library or with a, another large library. So uh, like a public library system um, can have a, a fairly substantial special collections. And so there are thousands and thousands of these across the world and uh, thousands across the United States. And they're, they are uh, extremely valuable when you have specific kinds of questions that, uh, that they have material to help you with. This is something to understand very quickly, and that is both archives and special collections have limitations on access. You don't just walk into an archive and say, and go pull, start pulling things off the shelf or opening books and looking or pulling open drawers. There's, not, there's nothing like that. Generally, the collections are closed in the sense that you can't check out any materials. You can't carry any materials out. And in fact, some of them have fairly substantial security. And uh, if you want to know about limited access, this picture here is of what? You think about it, I'm sure someone out there knows what this is, but uh, this happens to be the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. And if you've ever been to Washington, D.C. and gone to the National Archives, you know, you can go in and there's tours and they show you the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and all these other documents. And you can wander around and see all these marvelous documents. That's the front door. This is the back door. This is the door on the other street. It's on Constitution Avenue. And uh, you have, to, and it's unmarked. There is nothing here that tells you that this is the entrance to the National Archives. 
So if you don't know, you would never know. You could walk over to this door, pull the door open, and then you'll be into where you can go to find the material, actually gain access to the material. And we'll talk about that in uh, in just a few minutes. But here's here's some ideas. First of all, in order to get into these institutions, the archives and the special collections, sometimes you need appointments. So you, you cannot just walk through the door. Sometimes you have to get advanced. Um, there's archives uh, uh, that I've uh, dealt with that have uh, that you have to make a request. Uh, you have to have pre-qualifying for access. There are some extremely useful collections of historical stuff. You can't even get in unless you send a, a letter petitioning for entry and a time for entry and uh, how long you're going to be there, what you're going to do, what your qualifications are, who's sponsoring this, what institution, and on and on. And so most of this stuff is not like you would do for a, a, the public library. You have maybe someplace near your town or downtown. Uh, you have to have, in a lot of cases, you have to have credentials. You have to be an approved researcher in a, on a certain topic. Now, that's not impossible. And uh, for example, at the National Archives that we're standing here, you, you go in and you do have to fill out a long form to, to get the information. They have to ask what you're intending to do, what kind of research, and then you have to um, actually have to deposit in a, in a locker anything you're carrying that, that isn't part of the, what they allow into the archives, which changes slightly over time. Uh, and you can get find out the latest information about what they allow. At one point in time, they would allow you uh, nothing more than one pencil and some paper and uh, uh, nothing else. And sometimes that was, but that's increased. There's a little bit more. Some, some re have restrictions on anything else you can bring in. Uh, other other archives handle it a little bit differently. They're not particularly care what you carry in, except for pens. They do not want that you to write on anything uh, or any of the documents or handle the documents directly. And some require um, gloves for handling any documents. And uh, many of them have extensive training before you can gain access. At the Library of Congress, for example, you have to go through training and watch the videos and, and fill out the forms. And then they will give you a card that gives you access to the reader's room, which is not necessarily access to, uh, to all the materials. Sometimes not all the materials are on, on site. So even if you go to the library like, or the, the archive, uh, like the Library of Congress is a good example, uh, anything you're wanting other than what happens to be on the shelf is uh, you can only you have to request and it takes two to three days usually or this could take five days to get the materials. There are also limited opening times for access and that's uh, that depends on each of the institutions. You have special instructions on how you handle the materials, what you can do with the materials once, they're delivered, you may not even be able to touch them. You may be only able to look at them. Uh, this is the kind of thing that can that can happen. No electronics, that's, uh, it's not so common now. They've finally understood that if you want to take pictures of the documents, that that doesn't damage the documents, but there'll be no flash. And uh, you can use, right now, the best thing to do is to use your smartphone for taking pictures without a flash. Um, because it's easy to carry in and they usually have no, it's less, let's say there's lesser uh, amount of restrictions on like on taking pictures. Um, if they do make copies, uh, be prepared to pay a substantial amount um, of uh, for the, uh, on a limited basis, they may not, they may have a certain number of copies you can make per day or whatever, but be prepared to pay what you would think to be a rather exorbitant price per copy. 
because it's uh, there's their overhead is is tremendous. There's lots of other things. There's just in order to even begin to go in and work in an archive, you need to go through the, the archives website or any material that they may have, talk to them by phone, get the get the total list of all of their requirements and and just be very careful to follow all the requirements. Otherwise, basically they can just deny you access. And that's uh, the only purpose you would wanna go through all this for is to get in. So here's one thing though that not too many people think about or do, and that's called walking the shelves. And uh, in some archives and some repositories, you have access. Once you once you get in, then you actually have access to a fairly large amount of information. That's less. It's usual, not as usual with with uh, formal archives. And it's not as usual as uh, in some library special collections. Usually, the, if there's a special collections, they're the items they don't want you to walk by and look at. But I would encourage everyone, when you visit a library or archives or whatever, to the extent that's possible, walk around. Um, one of the things that ha happened, uh, I was mentioning before we got started, that I started very early in, in going to libraries. And one of the things I learned how to do to find what I wanted was to what I call walk the shelves. And I still do that. And I do that um, whenever I am looking for anything that is specific and I, and I don't find it readily in the catalog. Because... I've learned over the years that the catalogs are not complete and they're not accurate. And uh, one of the stories that I tell about that problem was I was doing a, a paper at the University of Utah on uh, Christopher Columbus because I was a Spanish major. And one of the things they had us to do was write a, write a report. And so I chose to write on Christopher Columbus and I began to look for his original journals. Um, Basically, and I was the time I was employed at the library as a bibliographer, so I was very much familiar with the with the stacks, with the with the books that were there in the library and the card catalog, which I worked with constantly as long as I worked there. And so I knew every I knew how to do this, but it was still surprising because what I found was that as I walked the shelves, is that all the all of the catalog material that was on Columbus did not have his original journals in Spanish, of course. And so I was basically looking for those and discovered that they were in another section of the library and they were not cataloged under Christopher Columbus. They were cataloged under the Hakliot Society. So there's things you have to learn as you go about working and, and uh, doing research in these libraries is that you may not what they tell you they have, what they show on the catalog, and what is actually on the shelves may not may not always agree. And so there's sometimes it's it's important to keep asking questions and keep uh, looking to see if there's some other avenue or some other way that the material was cataloged, and that gives you a little bit better idea. Now this is even more the case when you get to a card catalog. My wife and I had opportunity to work for a year in the Maryland State Archives, uh, digitizing records for family search. And, and of course, we didn't do that all day long every day. We had breaks and we had lunch hour and things like that. So there was times when I was I had time to do some of the research that um, some people would send me questions and I would go look up the stuff for them. Well, so I... In, in getting into the library, into the archives, the Maryland State Archives, and it's could change. Everything changes over time, so this may be an old story, but it's it's uh, kind of indicative. This was part of the catalog. This is this is the uh, this is what the Maryland State Archives catalog looked like, and it was a very tall. You can see it's a lot of ranks of of cards, and uh, it was huge. It was four or five of these cabinets that were just mammoth. 
um, cabinets of, of cards, maybe a few hundreds of drawers full of cards, probably millions of cards in there. And the first thing I ask is, um, is all this online? Have you digitized the cards? Oh, no, they're not. But some of them are, but they're not all digitized. And then I would notice that the people who were working at the reference desk there in the archives, every time there was a question, they would have to get up, come over the card catalog to look it up. And so this is this is sometimes this is what happens. Uh, you just have to be um, able to understand. And the, and the card catalog, by the way, was not set up alphabetically. You didn't go to A, B, C, D, F, G to look up your names of the people, for example, or or types of things. It was set up in in sections, and each section was chrono chronologically organized. And then each of the chronological sections was organized by catalog, not by alphabet. So going through this was uh, a process of, of discovering how the catalog was organized and then attempting to fit what you were looking for into that organization. Um, just to be this a caution, because um, you don't want to pack up your, your bags and go, and I'll come back to this. I hear people traveling across the, the, the world, and particularly I hear this of people going to Europe, and they say, well, I'm going to take a trip to Europe, and then I'm going to look for my ancestors. And so they go to Europe, and they go into the car, to the catalog, um, you know, they go to the archive. Uh, where the records are stored and they search it down and they get there during the day when it's open they go in and they say i'm searching for this and this and my ancestor lived here in this this year and whatever and the people look at them and say well all that information's at the family history library in salt lake city utah so one of the prerequisites not only do you have to um Order, sometimes order content weeks in advance or days in advance, as I mentioned just a moment ago about the Library of Congress. But sometimes you have to make sure that you're not just coming when all that's, when everything you want has already been digitized and already is sitting on some other website. So it might not be on the Family History Library website. It may be on the Ancestry website. It may be on MyHeritage. It may be on one of the other websites that's online or they may have their own website and all the material that you're looking for is on the archive or library's website so um this is important to understand that most of the archive documents that you're wanting are only available to use while you're in the library so they're not circulation libraries and as i mentioned uh copying may be uh either expensive or uh, you may not be able to just make any kind of copy that you want. And in the Library of Congress, uh, at one point in time, they were requiring you to copy out by pencil anything that you, any information that you wanted. And I've had that, I've had that recently in libraries where, and in archives where they have said, um, if you need it, walk, copy it out. We don't want pictures taken. Now, it's important to understand that many of the items that are in these large um, repositories are can be very unique. There is a one-of-a-kind letter or a one-of-the-kind Bible or a one-of-the-kind um, document, and that that's the only place on the face of the earth where that particular document resides. So there are things that are uh, absolutely um, valuable, extremely valuable for researchers. And persistence pays, and the time that you spend may very well uh, produce ex extraordinary amount of information. Now, so here's, here's the question you would probably ask at this point. So let's suppose the Family History Library, which is um, reportedly to be the largest collection of, of uh, genealogical information in the world. And it's sitting there in Salt Lake City. And hasn't everything been digitized? All the microfilm has been digitized. Well, that's true, yes. But not all of the digitized microfilm has been cataloged or made readily available yet. So there's still some items that you have to get through what's called the images collection on FamilySearch. If you're not familiar with that, there's 
a couple of uh, videos that we've done about where are all the records on family search. So if you get back and look for those videos, you'll see that there's lots of things that are sort of under the table things that you can't get to directly unless you go to images under the search menu. But even though that's the case, there's still items there, even in the family history library that are unique. And primarily, for example, an easy example are books because many people have compiled and printed a book and that book may be uh, had one copy made or it may had five or six copies made and those may have been given to people who have no appreciation for what they have and so they're just lost but the family history library say they may have given a copy of that book to the family history library in which case there it is and it's the only copy that's available any place and um just always bear in mind that we need to spend a considerable amount of effort and time researching what records are available online and then seeing what kind of access you have to those records. It doesn't do you any good to go to the big, uh, big repository and then end up finding out that they're all available online and you could have spent a lot less time and a lot less effort sitting in your own front room or wherever you're in front of your own computer and, and gotten all the information. So that's that's kind of where we are. We're in this transition zone where there's still a tremendous amount of information that's not online, that's still wrapped up in the archives and libraries, as opposed to, uh, well, the billions and billions and billions of records that we already have online. So it's it's important to become familiar across the board on different places. Now, I've been trying to do some, res some uh, presentations and classes on some of these useful uh, uh, resources like archive.org, which I'll mention again, and uh, which is now, the, as far as I'm concerned, the largest uh, repository of records on the, that we have in the world. I do not find anything else that has the access and the digitized records that are available on that one website. So you need to become familiar with all that before you start spending a lot of money. Now, there's this is called um, the Archive Grid, and it's part of an organization called OCLC.org um, and OCOCLC.org. And you can find it by typing in Archive Grid at, and um, then you can find this uh, access to this. It's, there's also an access out of the Family History Library catalog, the Family Search catalog um, on familysearch.org. So when you open the catalog, there's a link that says Archive Grid. I don't know whether they, they keep redoing everything all the time and it may not be there anymore, uh, in which case that's a kind of a loss to the community. But uh, it's still there, our credit group is still there. And this is uh, millions of, of records, not the records themselves, they're described. The archive material being described that's in the library. So this in the archive, this is how you find out what's in that particular archive. You can see this little map here and you can click on any state and see where all the archives are. And this was just the archives in this part of the United States. And then there's... Um, over 1400 archival institutions representative, represented. So you can go here and get um, sort of an overview of what are in those collections and what's available at those collections. And then obviously from there, you can try to figure out um, what part of it, what, how you gain access and go through the websites to and the instructions or contact them to find out what, what kind of other things you would need to know in order to to do some research. This is an example of what you might see uh, in looking in archives uh, in, um, in the archive website, in archive grid. And then this is just for my example, this is a, a 21.25 linear feet of documents uh, relating, and at the point, at the time I was doing a lot of research on the, the Tanner family and my uh, this person who wrote this and collected this, this was my great great uncle 
or my great uncle. Yeah, no, yes, because he's my grandfather's brother. And then he would be, uh, he was a professor, um, actually institute director in Idaho in the, that uh, BYU, Idaho. And he collected all this information about the, the place and all the people. Now, in this collection, this is called the George S. Tanner Papers, and there's nothing there that tells you what's in this. And so you need to go into the archive grid or do a search online, and then they'll have a list of all the papers. What you'll find out is what he collected was biographies and autobiographies and family histories of virtually everyone who had lived in that town and their descendants. So uh, the information is vast and this is not unique. And this is the kind of thing you can expect to find in an archive. Now, this was another collection. This was uh, at, the, at the University of Arizona. And this is my great grandmother. And uh, we I knew she had been a professional photographer all of her life. And, um, this is my grandmother's in the middle of this picture uh, at the back. And uh, she um, and all of her, all of her um, negatives and, and photographs that she'd done over her lifetime, uh, I had never been able to find them or knew where they were. And I one day got a call out of the blue that said, uh, would you like all the photographs? And of course, we drove as far as we needed to, which was, by the way, only across Phoenix. And one of my cousins had been preserving them, carrying them around for like 15 or 20 years. And uh, we picked, we got those and it was in uh, three big containers, giant containers that weighed close to 100 pounds each. It was very hard to get those into my car. Anyway, so these, after processing those and digitizing all of those images and putting them, uh, the bulk of the a majority of them onto family search, uh, I then donated the originals boxes so they would be preserved and the original glass negatives and negatives and photos to the University of Arizona where they have now in the University of Arizona's special collections and they have this entire catalog available for people who come to the library and do the research with these photographs. And then um, another collection was my other great-grandmother uh, who had worked on genealogy most of her life and uh, her, her documents had disappeared. And I received a call one day from my mother who said, your aunt has some boxes in the basement she's gonna throw out and do you want them? And I said, of course I want them. I don't, what's in them? And she said, we don't know, but you can have them. And it turned out to be all of the, the genealogy done by my great grandmother for 30 years of her life. And this, I went through and digitized everything in this, in this huge pile and, uh, and processed it all in. And this became uh, a substantial contribution to the Family Search Family Tree when it was created because all of this information was available already uh, in digital format and so was added to, uh, directly added to the Family Search Family Tree. And then digital copies of all the documents were given to the Family History Library and uh, they have that on their computers in the, in the Family History Library. The original documents and all this collection went to the um, Brigham Young University Special Collections. So all of these documents have been preserved. So people ask me all the time, well, I have all this stuff from my parents, my grandparents, and, and we want to just donate it all. And where can we give it? Who wants it? And the answer is somebody might. Now, if it's original stuff, they do. If it's a bunch of copies, forget it. If it's, especially if it's printouts or old GEDCOM files, nobody wants it. But if it's, uh, original documents, letters, uh, things like that. There may be a historical society or a library or a special collections or uh, an archive that be willing to um, to take the information if it's if it's actually original. So I'm going to say this again: always check to see if the items you need are online. 
spend your time learning how to do research online and and become competent competent and confident enough to uh, to determine that you really do need to go down into Kentucky or off to Ohio or down into Mississippi to do some research because you are reasonably con- um, assured that what you're looking for is first of all there or possibly there and secondly that it hasn't already been digitized and that you just didn't know where to look at it. So here's the Internet Archive. It's archive.org. It's basically a 718 billion web page uh, copy of everything on the Internet uh, that's ever been. And it's very useful. And I've been using this recently to kind of resurrect some of the old websites and, and get some history out of out of it. Uh, especially about family search and roots tech and things like that. But there's this are the, all the different kinds of materials they have. And going across, you've got uh, you've got documents and and files. You've got books, digitized books, uh, film, audio files, old television file or shows and files, radio shows and files, um, software archive of old software and um, images and all sorts of information. This place just gathers and the number is is getting to be fairly astronomical because at 35 million completely digitized, completely searchable word by word books online for free to look at. And in most cases, you can check them out, even if it's only for an hour. If they're even if they're copyrighted, you can still look at them in almost a hundred percent of the cases. And this this makes this by a large margin the largest available library in the world. So you, you really, really need to to start to look at this stuff and begin to know what's there. This is the European version. Uh, this has um, millions of images and documents and texts and sounds and video. And unfortunately, neither of these, uh, the, the internet archive, archive.org actually has a section for genealogy, but uh, European, it's just sort of spread across, but it, it may be a challenge, but this is a fabulous resource for uh, finding just about anything you can think about. And this is, if you didn't know it, the Digital Public Library of America, or dp.la, dp, Delta Papa, dot, Lima, Alpha. That's the whole address. And this is, uh, the number here, this is about mm, probably eight or seven or eight years old. And the number has gone from zero up to 46 million images, texts, and videos in just that time. And they are very aggressively out there uh, acquiring uh, huge collections of additional material. By and large, it's all free to view. Uh, it's some copyrighted materials are are restricted for copying purposes, but um, it's all mostly all free to view. That's basically the way that this was set up. Uh, of course, there is the National Archives, and um, you, you once you understand what I said earlier that you don't just show up at the National Archives and expect to do research. That's not going to happen. You need to be very well versed in exactly what you need to take with you, what you need to have as far as credentials uh, besides a driver's license. And you need to be able to uh, wait and then make an appointment act essentially to talk to someone who will there sit there and figure out if there's really anything you want that they can supply to you. And um, it, it's very important to understand this. So determine where they are by using the archives catalog. Now, let me, I'm going to give you a little example here, and we're going to go into some different types of records, but I'm going to come back to that. So how do you know if you need to go to, or how do I know if I need to go to the archive? Or how do you know that if you need to go to the archive? And the answer is very simple. When you understand when and how to use an archive, you'll find a need to visit one. So it, once you understand 
what it might have and what you kinds of records that you need to have and what you're looking for and um, where you have to go to get those records. Now, I have a list of, of end of line people, not, call, I'm not gonna call them brick walls because I'm certain there's more information, but mm -hmm. I have a, a, a list of end of line people and I don't know if I'll live long enough, but I, I, if I do, I will spend the time at some point to go to these places and look for the information in, on records that I am reasonably assured will be there and I'm reasonably assured have not yet been digitized. And I've been watching to see if additional records have been digitized and so far they have not. So let me kind of discuss the kinds of things that might be in um, an archive that you wouldn't find um, online today. The Civil War pension files, to some extent, uh, there are some indexes and there's some other things online. Um, there's some information from uh, Ancestry.com and from Fold3, which is owned by Ancestry, Fold3.com. Um, both of which are subscription websites, um, and those records are are they've not been digitized. The the full pension rec record files, and that's probably the one area of um, research in the United States that I think would be most benefited by, by the digitization of the records. The National Archives, if you go to the National Archives website, it's huge, it's a lot of information, and uh, it's very difficult to work your way through everything. And they will talk about National Archives partners and people who are like Ancestry and Family Search who have been digitizing records. And then they don't mention archive.org, who has been probably digitizing more than anyone else. And they also don't mention the fact that the number of records that they have digitized is like 0.00001% of all the records they have. They have made little or no effort over the years to make digital copies of all their records available. Uh, given the, the huge number of records. And I'll explain how that works in just a minute. Okay, so here's uh, another set of records that um, I do not find uh, available, very available. Family Search has uh, quite a few records, but compared to the available, the amount of records that are available at the National Archives level, um, this is, it's, it's just it's incredible. Okay, so some time ago, one of my one of the people came to me and said, uh, "I need to find uh, some information about one of my ancestors, who was a Sioux Indian." And I said, "Okay, fine. Most of those records are uh, in the library uh, in the National Archives." So then we got online, and we started to look for the records in the National Archives, and so we had the records that were available there were all in, and this is this is another thing that, that to get into it to understand, the records were not in the National Archives of Washington, D.C. They were in the National Archives in Kansas City, Missouri. The Sioux Indian Reservation is the Rosebud Reservation up in North Dakota. And it is basically all of the day-to-day -day transactions and all of the names of all the people and all of that information about everybody on the reservation is just sitting in cubic feet of records. And that's another thing that will happen with uh, like the National Archives. They won't say how many pages there are. They'll say how many feet of what shelf space it takes up, like I just read for the Georgia Tanner papers. Or in this case, it's cubic feet of records. Is there access to the records? That's something you have to determine before you go traveling to Kansas City and start sitting in the archives. But you may find out that getting access to those records is not easy. And even if you are allowed access to the records, you're gonna have to know what you're asking for before you get there, because um, they're not just gonna let you go paw through all the piles. That's not usually happening. You may find that the only possible source for the records you're looking for is in an archive. Another, another example was um, someone came to me 
and this is in another um, Indian example, uh, came to me and said that their ancestors had come from a small island in the uh, Western Aleutian change, chain of islands up there in, in uh, by Alaska. And uh, did they have any records? And after some research, not uh, too extensive, um, I determined, yes, by the way, all those records, a, a cubic feet of those records is sitting in the National Archives. And so then we went through this whole process of how do we gain access to them? This is this is probably the only place those records are, lo are located. And they're certainly not digitized. They're certainly not anything that's from the National Archives like that that's been digitized, um, given the restrictions they have on digitization. Okay, so know what you're looking for before you pack your bags, get in the car and drive. Uh, you may find out that the archives aren't even open. Uh, they may only have access during the time that you're not available to be there. Uh, you may not, once you find that you have access to it, you may end up not having uh, given yourself enough time to uh, get access to all the records and uh, the help that you might need in getting into the, the records that you need. So these are, uh, and, and people ask me, well, can I hire people? Sometimes, sometimes it's possible to hire researchers who will go in, but I'm uh, very certain given the restrictions that even some of these researchers may be having difficulty getting into the archives. So just be aware that it can take weeks and to gain access, locate and study some of the, some of the documents. Um, and, uh, one thing I mentioned about walking the, walking the, uh, shelves, walking the, the stacks of books in the library. Um, I still do that. I'm a compulsive stack walker. I, I'm so much now online that I spend, I haven't spent a lot of time in, uh, physical paper libraries, uh, recently, um, except for the BYU, of course, the BYU library that I'm at. But even there, um, most of what I've been doing is still digital. And so uh, I only find a, occasional use or need to go find a physical book. In addition, most of the books that I've ne needed recently have turned out to be on the Internet Archive, on archive.org. And uh, I've had, uh, over the past year or so, I've had some fabulous discoveries of, of entire genealogies of families that I have kind of linked into as I go back and, and doing research on some of my family lines. And the, the amount of information that I've found online has been extraordinarily helpful. And still there's holes, as I mentioned, there's still gaps in the, in the research that I need to address by going to an archive or to a, a library someplace. Okay, um, this is this is kind of an important thing to understand also, and, and I can't give you uh, concrete examples other than my own examples um, that I've talked about, that the photographs that my grandmother, my great-grandmother did, or the records that my great-grandmother accumulated over 30 years, including a lot of rec rec letters and original documents that were uh, quite valuable. And those are the kinds of things that if they're going to end up in an archive, they will end up. And so it's only some kinds of research uh, and only for some locations will you always end up in an archive. And I've mentioned uh, the pension records. Once you get to that gap between around 1850 up to around 1870 or 80, and you find that your ancestor, um, or you believe your ancestor was a Civil War veteran, um, then you may have difficulty finding any additional information. Um, but if you can find a pension file, you may find everything you need, including Bible records and pedigrees and correspondence and everything you can imagine. Some of those pension files are, you know, inches thick with information, especially, and we're a benefits genealogist, especially if they kept denying the widow, the widower or 
uh, the widow, widow's uh, request for the, the for a pension. Uh, they would just keep adding more information until they thought they could convince the the uh, government to provide a pension. So these are the kinds of things that um, uh, you need to evaluate and be familiar with. Uh, how do you do this? How do you learn it? How do you know um, how to go when when this is what to do and how to do it? The only thing I can say is it's just a matter of doing it. It's a matter of getting used to going into library. If you visited the Family History Library in Salt Lake City, here's what I'd encourage you to do. It's, let's say you're doing research in, um, in a state, and I'll pick a state, New York, for example, and you're looking for ancestors who came in or immigrated into New York. I guess my question to you would be, have you gone to the Family History Library in Salt Lake to do some research? And the second question I'd ask would, when you got there, did you walk the shelves? Did you go to the section of books on New York and look at every single book, pull them one by one off the shelf to see if there was anything in that book that might be helpful to you and your research? Well, if you see somebody in the library doing that, then you'll know that they are they're familiar with the process of getting information out of libraries and archives. And uh, if you happen to see me doing it, um, then you'll understand. I give the, the shelving people a lot of work because I will uh, take half a dozen books off the shelf, put them on a table, go through them and look at the, the uh, indexes and, uh, and the lists of materials and see if there's any information. By doing that, I have managed to find probate records. I have managed to find um, connections to um, verified connections to uh, whole lines of, uh, of research. So it's just, uh, it's just a process that we go through when we're doing and working through all this. Okay, so search the catalog. This is just an exercise. Go in to a, a local archive, okay? In, in the United States, every state has a state archive. So when you were doing research in whatever, fill in the blank state in the United States, had, did you go online and look through and see what kinds of records were in the state archives for that state? This is a picture of the Maryland State Archives where we worked for a year. And after a year of being there, I was just barely beginning to understand how their records worked, where they were, and what kinds of records they had. And Maryland has records going back in the Maryland archives. They have records back to um, the back into the colonial times. And as as doing digitizing records, primarily we were digitizing probate records. And guess whose uh, signatures ended up on the probate records? George Washington, like, you know, the president, Washington person, and others. Here we are. We're looking in the, in the piles of records that they give us in the books. And we unfold a record, and there is the document, original document signed by George Washington. And uh, that was not unusual that we would find something like that. Of course, we'd whip out our, our cameras and take pictures of it real quick. So we knew what we'd looked at. But, and we were allowed to do that. There was no problem. They didn't care if we took pictures of their documents. So the, that's just, it's just kind of an amazing situation um, that, that you can, that this is out there. This is the world. And this is a level of research and, and, uh, and record searching that, uh, I would I encourage I would encourage everyone to, to begin that process of understanding and that. And before we were starting, I was contemplating whether or not I would say this, but I will say this: that this is Nick. By next year, I will have been going into libraries and doing research for seventy years. So you can start to figure out that uh, it may take a while. Okay, well, thanks for watching.